Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri. My goal is to help military veterans and the military community succeed in their civilian career. Normally, I do that every Tuesday and Thursday by interviewing either a military veteran about their civilian career, what they do, how they got there, and other advice for other veterans seeking that sort of career path. Or I talk to uh, members of the community at large who can impart wisdom to help our audience in their civilian career. Uh, this Saturday episode format called Behind Beyond Uniform is uh, different than that. It's much more informal, no notes or maybe slight notes, and uh, a little bit of ramblings about professional items and personal items. Normally I do this in a mullet format, business up front, party in the back. Uh, today I'm going to blend the two. Um, uh, this is coming out during 4th of July weekend. I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to do a really uh, diligent effort to stay unplugged as much as possible. So I'm just going to go right after recording an episode that I just, just recorded minutes ago with Charlie Plum. And this episode will not air until august 1st so you'll have a, a full month to stew on this before uh before this episode comes out but it was so uplifting and so motivational and it tied into two different things that i've been talking about on these saturday episodes that i wanted to just kind of in the moment record some quick reflections and apologies it's not too structured i took a lot of notes uh during the call some for beyond the uniform and just some for myself and they're not organized. I'm doing this while doing the interview. So I just want to kind of flip through some of these notes to, to pass them on to you in case they're encouraging. And the first thing that stood out to me is over the last couple of weeks on the Behind the Beyond, Beyond the Uniform episodes, I've been talking a lot about discomfort and the role that discomfort plays in our lives. And that can be getting out of your comfort zone as um, you know, we talked in one of the episodes about my upcoming interview with Stephen Cannon, who is CEO of Mercedes-Benz USA. And Stephen, at the end of his episode, talks about how everything great in his career and in his life comes when he gets out of his comfort zone. And so we've talked about that in weeks past, about the value of stepping out of one's comfort zone. And then on a couple other episodes, we talked about the role that discomfort plays in our life and how we can often numb ourselves to that discomfort. And that the purpose of that pain and discomfort can often be to get us out of the situation, right? The purpose of pain, if I hold my hand to a candle flame, is to tell my body immediately, get out of this environment, like change, <laughs> get, get away from this. And when we numb ourselves to that discomfort, we're really doing ourselves a dis dis uh, disservice in the long run because we're going to remain in a situation where we shouldn't remain. Our body, our mind, our spirit is telling us something. This isn't right. This isn't the right relationship, the right job, the right circumstances for me. And that can be motivational to get out of it. But when we numb ourselves, when we use alcohol or pot or drugs or... or uh, movies or phones or TVs or sex or porn or a million different things that we can numb ourselves with. And, and personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with any of those things. I think that a lot of it is how you use them. But when we use those things to numb ourselves, we can end up staying in a situation longer than we really should. So the, the way that this showed up in my interview, uh, so Charlie Plum uh, he spent 2,103 days as a prisoner of war in, in Vietnam. And a lot of his message, we talk about mental attitude, we talk about finding your purpose and resilience. But a lot of his message was around finding the good news in any situation and acting on it. That even when things seem like the worst thing in the world to us, finding the value knowing, he says, there is value in adversity, go find it. And his other quote that I love is, adversity is a horrible thing to waste. Adversity is not horrible, but wasting it is. And his view was that in any adversity, there is value. 
And so rather than just feeling bad for oneself, feeling like the victim, complaining, being angry or bitter, really setting out to figure out what is the purpose of this adversity. And, and as it relates to this whole thought of distraction, we had this dialogue around how he had no distraction as a prisoner of war. Like one of the advantages, if you can even call it, he called it an advantage, if you can even call there being an advantage of being a prisoner of war, is they didn't have happy hour in Hanoi. He was not having access to alcohol or phones or TV or any of these things. He was forced to deal with the fact that he was stuck in an eight by eight cell, that he was in isolation, that he had wounds that were not getting better, that did not receive medical attention, that he did not have food, that he did not have adequate sleep or nutrition or anything. And he had to find the value of that. He had to say, look, this is a rotten turn, but how can I find the value in it? And I, I think that that's just really powerful. It was powerful for me, especially as we had these uh, Saturday one-way conversations to see how he had this tie-in to adversity and to not, uh, not numbing out, to not getting lost in the distraction. And he talked about it as like getting up off your couch. Stop feeling sorry about yourself. Go find the value. A second thing that he talked about that was just really, I had, I had the chills when he said it, but if you listen to last week's episode, we talked a little bit about the warrior, the concept of the warrior. We talked about that in a couple different ways. And he said that the, the thing that turned around his perspective when he was a prisoner of war, and I believe he said he had spent a couple of years feeling sad and sorry for himself and like a victim and hating his captors. And what he, he said turned it around was that um, uh, Admiral Stockdale, who for a period of time was the senior officer of his camp, said, hey, we are warriors, not victims. He told Charlie, and this is through underground communication, they're in isolation, but finding ways to communicate in their cells. He said, essentially, get over it. We are warriors. We have a purpose here. And we as warriors will, will pursue that to our last dying breath. There's no victims here. And I thought that was just really powerful for me to hear. I think that you know, I have not been in anything even remotely close to the discomfort that Charlie has experienced. And I don't want to undervalue the pain, the loss, the isolation, the challenge and, and setbacks that I've experienced in my life and that all of us experience in our lives as part of this human experience. That we will, no matter what, until we die, we will have pain and suffering. We will have things not go our way. We will have loss. We will have uh, you know, sorrow. Those things are unavoidable, but what Charlie really spoke to in this interview is the one thing, the only thing that we have power over is our attitude. And that's, you know, when he describes it like that, it makes me think, you know, that is an aspect of being a warrior, is choosing day in or day out to be proactive, to, to, to claim the power that you have in any situation, which may not, especially in his situation, it may not be power over the environment. He talked about how the best people in a war, they're not sent to the prison camps, they're sent to the front lines. And so he was tended to literally by teenagers in Vietnam who abused them in many ways, as you can imagine some teenager having power over a grown adult. And, you know, so he didn't have control or power there over his external environment, but he did have power in his view of the situation and choosing to search for the good and choosing to forgive those who were abusing him rather than having this acid eat away inside of him and ruin his life. And um, so that was one of the things I thought that was really great. Uh, we talk a lot about purpose, and it doesn't have to be in your job. He, he attributes the, the high suicide rate with veterans 
to that lack of purpose that could be found in philanthropy and volunteering and religion and other things. And, you know, just again, he, I'm just looking through my notes, he talked about resilience, that attitude, something good is happening here. Something good is happening here. What is it? Let me find that missing puzzle piece. And what I liked about his story, we didn't get this till, till the end, but um, I was trying to steer the conversation towards like how he supported his family while he was away. And in the conversation, I realized that five and a half years in to his six plus year captivity, his wife divorced him. And he had spent 20, you know, he spent his time there building up in his mind what the next 20 years would look like when he returned home. And obviously his wife, now ex-wife, was a major component of what those 20 years would look like. And so to come back after this horrific experience and be in recovery in the hospital and to really have the wool, the, the rug pulled out from under him, realizing that everything he had planned on, the foundation that he had built his life on was now gone. What I loved about hearing this story is, you know, of course he felt sad. Of course he felt hopeless. Of course he felt like a victim. And he picked himself up. He applied what he had learned in this prisoner of war experience. And what we talked about as part of this is, this is not a once and done thing. For Charlie, he didn't become a prisoner of war, develop this mental attitude and check the box, he's good for life now. He's just going to see everything through rose-colored glasses. This is a daily practice for him. This is a daily, you know, in that hospital, it was the first real-world test outside of Vietnam in his new life of, can I apply this attitude and succeed? And I find that even more refreshing than this thought that there's some life-changing experience that permanently altered him and he's good to go. I respect him more knowing, you know, going back to this warrior concept, he is a warrior every day. He is choosing this every day. And he talks about for himself, he uses prayer, reading, podcasts to fill his mind with positive nutrition, as he says it. But it is, it's building up this muscle of tenacity, of choosing to find the positive even in the most horrific situations. Um, he had a great quote, the wrinkles in the plan of life. And you're validating this philosophy every time you decide to smile instead of frown. It is these small acts that add up. And I just want to share that because I know, you know all of us face setbacks. Maybe you're in the midst of a divorce. Maybe you've lost a friend or coworker or child or parent. Maybe you are switching jobs or you've lost your jobs or, or maybe things are going great right now, but I'm imagining that you don't have to look too far in your past. Or you probably don't have to wait too long in your future to know that there's going to be some setback. It's, 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 it's invariable, but I hope that you take this as encouragement that when that next setback comes to, to adopt that positive mentality, to find the positive piece of the puzzle, to find the good, and to convince yourself there is some good in this. In that situation with Charlie, it was years later that he met his now wife with whom he has four kids. He's built a beautiful life. But you know, it might not be immediate, but there will be some good in it. And adopting that mindset can make all the difference. The last thing that stood out was just, um, you know, he talked about at the end, he really chooses to live a simple life. And I love that. I think that we can make our lives overly complicated, that we can really just fill it to the brim. I, I think about this a lot, honestly, right now. Of um, I'm a, a big advocate of meditation and mindfulness, of cultivating a skill of trying to be present and aware and alert and just aware of what's going on around you rather than lost in thought all the time. And I think of it kind of as, you know, with inspiration. And I love Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a book called, um, uh, God, what am I, I can't believe I'm, oh, Big Magic, The Art of Creative Living. And in Big, Big Magic, she kind of personifies inspiration. She says, inspiration rewards those who wake up at 5 a.m. Um, but I love this thought of like when inspiration comes, like when inspiration or intuition or some sort of knowledge comes to me, 
am I even going to be aware enough to receive it? Or am I going to be replaying some movie I watched or thinking about what's coming up or planning or stewing on something that's happened? Will I actually be aware and alert to, to pay attention and hear that? And I view that as kind of a daily practice. Like I, I try to meditate every day as an as, as effort to build up just being present to what's going on right now. And, you know, more and more now, part of that is like, yeah, I want to build up that muscle. So when I have an experience that I can learn something from, I'm actually paying enough attention to learn it. And I think, you know, I take that point of living simply as another way of decluttering our life so that we can be more present and be more alert and attentive when something, something big comes along. And he, he said along with that, one of the secrets of life is knowing you can fail and taking personal responsibility that you're going to make it. So I hope that something in this resonated with you, and um, I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July weekend. I'll be back on Monday and Thursday with more episodes. Talk soon.